from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you, and here's what's ahead. K-State's Art Barnaby will offer final thoughts on enrolling 2018 summer field crops in crop insurance. He stresses that paring back on coverage as a cost-cutting move is not a good idea right now. Art also comments on what producers were saying about the future of the crop insurance program at that series of Farm Bill Forums co-hosted by K-State. Also today, K-State's Greg Ibendahl will talk about a new economic model he's put together, which uses weekly USDA crop condition report information to predict the final yield of the state's winter wheat crop. And on this week's K-State Horticulture segment then, Ward Upham will talk about planting and managing garden asparagus. All that here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today on this 15th of March, mentioning the date because this is the final day for you summer crop producers to enroll your crops in the federal crop insurance program and uh, solidify those coverages for 2018. Some last-minute considerations on that and other crop insurance matters now with Art Barnaby. As you know, Art is a risk management specialist, K-State Research and Extension. He is on the road today. And Art, just very generically here, any final things that you think producers should be thinking about upon this deadline today? Well, looking outside here in uh, Liberal, it's really dry out here. Yeah. Uh, I certainly wouldn't uh, reduce my coverage this year. Uh, so we never know. It may start raining in two weeks, but right now it doesn't look particularly good, and I certainly would hope everybody's got their coverage in place. One can modify their coverage right up to the end of the day today. Is that correct? That's correct. But if you're going to do that, you need to get a hold of your agent right away. The uh, crop insurance thing, too, we put out a paper on Ag Manager that I think got a little bit misunderstood, or maybe it's just a case I'm hearing from the people that didn't get a premium reduction. Mm -hmm. What's going on there is the volatility is way down. I mean, near a record low on corn. And it just so happens the projected price is 396, exactly what it was a year ago. And so if nothing else changed, then your premiums would be less this year. However, RMA in many counties, and particularly the higher risk counties, they raise the underlying rate that more than offset the loss in vol the lower volatility, so the premiums are about the same as a year ago. Um, the only parts of the state where you might see some reduction in your premiums would be Donovan County, Atchison up in there, or some of the better irrigated corn growing areas may see some reduction. But for the most part, the premiums won't be any different than last year, although uh, initially, it sure looked like they were going to be just because of that big drop in volatility. But the bad news is next year, uh, if they leave those rates at their current level, and I don't have any reason to believe they'd lower them, and volatility returns to a more normal level, then farmers are going to see a significant increase in their premiums. But I guess we'll worry about that next year. First, we've got to get through this year. The point being, though, you have heard from producers who have said there's no premium reduction for me, but that's yeah. the part of the, the picture here, and it's not consistent broadly across the entire state. Uh, it's not consistent across the state nor the country either. As a general statement, it's the lower-risk counties that will see a premium reduction. And that doesn't describe a bunch of Kansas. This is a pretty high-risk growing state. Mm -hmm. Even under irrigation, there's a significant amount of peril threat from both hail and wind, for example. By and large, though, your advice is that producers should, as best they can within their management 
uh, max out on their coverage uh, that will be a benefit to them and not be economizing in this area. That's your point here, right? Yeah, that's my point. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm suggesting farmers go to 85% coverage because okay, right. if you've ever looked at those premiums, that last 5% can be extremely expensive. And in some cases, the premiums actually exceed the coverage. Uh, that's a that's a rare case, but it really jumps that premium to get that last five percent of coverage. So, unless you're under irrigation, most farmers are not going to go there. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'm suggesting uh, this is not a year to economize by cutting the coverage in order to save some premium, right. because it's sure not shaping up like a year that you want to be going into with reduced coverage. And on this business with who would get uh, lower um, premiums, I think it's pretty clear the people I've heard from are the people not getting lower premiums. And most of the state probably is not getting lower premiums. You're going to see the lower premiums in Iowa and northern Illinois. As I said, there's a few spots in Kansas where I would expect that to happen. Once again, at the end of the business day today, lock down your coverage on 2018 production. The deadline is very much here. While we have you with us, Art, we did want to visit just briefly as well about some of the feedback you were getting concerning the crop insurance program and coverage availability at that series of Farm Bill forums that K-State Research and Extension and the University of Nebraska conducted the past couple of weeks at the three locations, and the crop insurance was on the agenda there. What are producers saying? Well, it was pretty clear that this group, again, a lot of these folks were either farmers, had a few crop agents, but they did not want any cuts in the crop insurance program, basically consistent with Senator Roberts' position. What did come up in the discussion on crop insurance was should they use crop insurance county yields rather than NAS county yields for determining the ARC payments under the FSA program. The reality is that change, um, it's been proposed, I think there's even legislation in Congress been introduced, won't fix the problem that farmers are upset about. And the reason is, is because it can rain on one side of the county and not the other. So you're still going to have situations where people are sitting there getting no payment and the county across the road is getting the maximum payment. And using RMA data won't fix that. The other thing is they'll have to redo, I think, the entire structure because the RMA yields don't necessarily track that well with the NASH yields. So they would need to take RMA historical yields and really reestablish the five-year Olympic average yield, too. And you do have counties where there's not a lot of participation in the crop insurance program. Remember, this is a, uh, the ARC program is a nationwide program. Mm-hmm. So what do you do then? And then thirdly, some counties, crops are minor crops are growing in that county. They have a program, but they don't have a lot of acreage. There in the central or west central part of Kansas, you'll have, uh, there's an area in there around Hayes that has a lot of acres that are non-irrigated. And they do, in fact, uh, have an RMA county yield for corn, but they get there by combining several counties together. In other words, there's not enough dry land corn growing in that area for a county to have enough data to generate its own county yield. So they, they actually have to pull data from other counties. These are all just statistical problems and the lack of data. There, there's, I don't think there's any real fix for what farmers want other than that's just the nature of the coverage that you're getting. And it's, I guess you could say it's a little bit random from a producer standpoint. Right. You said though, also that uh, there was some discussion about retaining the harvest price option as part of the uh, crop insurance makeup and producers were expressing thoughts on that as well. Well, that was my major point in my whole presentation was I, I, had a, an example with a graphic representation where I showed farmers where the donut hole was in their coverage if we had a 2012 year and the harvest price were eliminated. In those kind of years when the price goes up, the revenue coverage actually pays less than the old yield program 
at substantially less than the revenue protection program. At the same time, they probably will lose their FSA payment due to higher prices, uh, for sure, on PLC, which is ironic. That's where it started 30 years ago. Uh, we had the 1989 wheat crop failure. Farmers didn't have any wheat to sell at the higher price because the price went up as a result of that failure. And they lost their deficiency payment, which we now call PLC. And ARC also is reduced with higher prices. And their response was crop insurance didn't work because it only covered at best 65% of our yield. None of the loss and payments that we took from FSA, so we're way short of our expected revenue. Mm -hmm. Having listened to that, I thought they were right, and that's how I got started towards the working with the private sector to come up with some coverage that would cover that risk. And that really was the start of what later became CRC and now Revenue Protection. We keep renaming things without doing anything new, but that's okay. (laughs) The process will heat up as far as the farm bill, it sounds, as uh, Congress will return from the Easter recess. So some of this art in closing will start fleshing out somewhat soon, it would appear. Is that what you're picking up? Yeah, there's still a lot of discussion. Will we get a farm bill in time for sign-up next spring? Um, I will be shocked if we're signing wheat up in September. Hmm. It's not just a case of going through Congress. We have to remember... USDA has to go through and write the implementation rules, and that takes time because it's a you know it's a huge bill, and there's other parts besides crop insurance and the farm service agency payments. In fact, those are kind of a small percentage of the budget in that whole bill, and so I can't imagine that FSA is going to be ready for sign up before spring. Art, thanks for taking a few moments out of your agenda to join us right here, and good luck on the rest of your travels in Southwest Kansas. He is Art Barnaby, Risk Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension, and once more, speaking with Art in that this is the final day for enrolling your 2018 summer crop production in crop insurance. Take care of that business by the end of the day, if you haven't already, growers. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. As reported each week, the condition of the winter wheat crop in Kansas currently is somewhat suspect because of ultra-dry weather. Now, there is a way, via the method that our guest will talk about now, to take the official wheat reports that are posted by the USDA and convert them into a fairly reliable predictor of wheat yields at the end of the cropping season. Greg Ivendahl has joined us once again. He's an agricultural economist with K-State Research and Extension. He just put together this analysis, which is fully written out on the agmanager.info website. First of all, Greg, let's talk about the USDA's weekly reports. This is a series that goes back a long ways, right? Yeah, I found data basically going back to 1988 for this. I, apparently what they do is um, they start off with a weekly in the fall, and then over the wintertime they just do a monthly report, and then sometime in the spring they kind of kick it back and do a weekly report again. So it kind of varies when they do their first weekly report. The last few years they've been doing it uh, about the first week of March or so. But if you go back a little further, they, they didn't really start those until about the last part of March. And it's important to understand what comprises those reports, and you've looked into that as well. Yeah, basically they they look at soil moisture, and then they also look at the uh, average crop condition of the wheat, and they basically rank it into categories. Uh, ranging from excellent to very poor, and they and they kind of put a percent number for each one of those for the wheat crop. That's what makes up those reports, which you hear, by the way, on the broadcast regularly now. The, the first two weekly reports of the season have come out. To couple this in, wheat yields over time have tended to improve agronomically anyway, right? 
Yeah, I mean, if you go back and look at our our, our wheat trend yield line for what it yields have been doing, uh, basically what I've been showing since about 1970, there's about a quarter bushel per acre increase in the average uh, yield. So right now we're currently almost up to about 40 bushel per acre in our average wheat yield. And again, it depends on whether you're looking at planted acres or harvested acres, but it, it's getting up to the 40 bushel mark. Might just explain, it's pretty intuitive, but planted versus harvested, why when you consider what is planted originally and then what is harvested, that will influence the overall and yield. Yeah, there's a little bit of difference as you might expect. So you normally, we know how many acres are planted in wheat every year, and we know how what our production is, and then it's just a you know matter of dividing those two. And as you might expect, the uh, harvested acre yield is going to be higher than the planted acre yields because you know the worst wheat it, it tends to be kind of abandoned and torn up than something else with. So you're always going to see a little bit of higher yield for your harvested acres versus your planted acres. But it's not a whole lot if you look at the chart. I think it's maybe a, a bushel or so difference. Not not a great amount really. All right. Well, that is backdrop here. The intent is to try to associate the information provided by these reports to the eventual yield at the end of the growing season. And uh, this has been researched previously, right? Yeah, I kind of wondered when these things first came out. I said, well, has anyone ever tried to actually map out what the crop report was back to what the yield was. And uh, so I did, did a little bit, started doing a little bit of research on that. And uh, there was, there has been some research about that. I mean, not necessarily a whole lot, but there has been some about wheat. It goes back to a paper that was presented a couple years ago. And what they did, they basically took the crop report and converted those different categories into a numerical scale. So basically they assigned like a one for the excellent down to a zero for the very poor. And they weighted it accordingly from the zero to one. So basically you end up with an index from zero to 100. So if your entire wheat crop in the state is excellent, you're going to have a score of 100. If the entire wheat crop is very poor, you'll have a score of zero. And then you'll somewhere in between a 50 would be kind of like an average crop for the year here. So that's the way they did that. And then with the numerical score, then it's pretty easy to run regression and look at yield as a function of this this score index. You're calling this a crop condition index. Yeah, that was basically based on the previous research. That's what they called it, a crop condition uh, index. And we can use that to kind of make predictions about what we think the wheat yield might be based on the current crop condition. Well, here's where you've taken it and moved it forward here. What exactly have you been comparing here, and what did you uh, arrive at then, Greg? Well, so if you know, if we go back, and we do have weekly crop reports going back to 1988, but again, you know, some of those earlier years, they didn't start the crop reports until about the end of March. So basically, I looked at the crop condition reports either the last week of March or the first week of April. That was my baseline, and regressed that against what the um, final yield was for wheat to kind of get an idea of what we might expect for the final yield based on what the current crop conditioning is. Now, again, wheat is kind of one of those crops that can you know, look really bad, and suddenly you end up having a real good yield after the end because it is a pretty resilient crop. So it's not a, certainly not a perfect science. I don't want people to think that you know this is an exact measurement. And in fact, in my model, we, we get an R squared of 0.2, which is, you know, it's okay, but there's still a lot of variability in there. Uh, and again, this is pretty early in the season, too. So if we would do these indexes, which I plan to do later on, for the as the crop matures a little further, we'll, we'll get better accuracy. But right now, we're using those end of March crop reports, we get an accuracy of about twenty percent or so. What you've done so far, and you will continue to update this, is looked at what information is at hand concerning the 2018 crop and actually assigned an index number to it? Yeah, if you have me look at my report up on Ag Manager, I, I show the, the mapping between the yield and what I call the CCI index, this crop report index, to see for those. And you can see they, they match up fairly closely. Uh, they're, they, again, they don't hit it perfectly, but again, because the, you know we can do a lot better or worse than what you think it looks like in the field. But there is a, certainly a correlation between those, so better a better crop score, you know, does tend to give us a higher ending crop yield and vice versa. A lower score will give us a lower crop yield. So what is the yield number at the moment anyway? Well, as you might guess, you know, based on what the current crop condition report shows, our uh, our CCI index, the crop score, is pretty low. It's a uh, uh, well, in the paper I used 37, but it's actually gone down two more points since the one that came out here on the 11th here. So actually we're looking at a crop index score of 35, which is really pretty low. There's only been two years since 1988 where we've actually had a crop score this low or lower here. So again, you know, in that 30-year time frame, we're looking at, at only two years for the where the end of March uh, crop score has been as low as it what currently is. And again, that doesn't translate into a very good wheat yield. So, you know, my prediction for the current wheat yield for this year is basically going to be about six bushels lower than normal, which will give us an average state yield of about 33 bushels per acre.
Hmm. And just for comparison purposes, you mentioned those two other times where this CCI has been below 40, as that scale reads. Well, the yields were significantly lower at year's end, as it turned out. So there is a relationship here. Yeah, one thing I noticed here, so, you know, certainly our, our lowest yields for wheat are tended to be associated with, with lower the CCI scores. And the other thing I noticed here, too, that those years where we do have above average wheat yields, in every case, I think there was a CCI score was above average here. So to me, it's, it's setting up to be a, a fairly low wheat yield. So you will be continuing to reanalyze the numbers as the subsequent weekly reports come out. That's your intent. Yeah, I mean, like, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, the accuracy of this this model improves the closer we get to harvest. Something else I want to point out on this graph too is I, I put in two ninety uh, percent prediction bands to kind of give an idea of the variability in there. So if you look at those on, on the on the chart on my uh, publication on Figure Three, there's there's two dotted black lines. That is a range where you can, 90% of the time, you can expect your yield to fall based on what the current CCI score is. So with a CCI score of 35, you're looking at potentially a range of maybe like 5 bushel above average to maybe potentially maybe like 18 to 20 bushels below average. That would, that would encompass 90% of the outcomes that we could expect based on the current CCI score. So instead of an exact number, that gives you a variability there that can be somewhat realistic and give you a, a solid, consistent ballpark idea of yeah, what that yield might be. Yeah, right now I say, you know, currently we're probably, you know, looking at, at an average probably six bushels below average. But again, there's a range within that. So, you know, I, I would say anything from about an average yield to maybe 20 bushels below average would be uh, would be in the realm of possibility for this year. So, Greg, now that you've put this together and now that you will be consistently updating it, how do you hope producers will use this information? I really expect this year we're going to have probably more abandoned acres than wheat than we probably ever have in the state. You know, it goes back to the combination of low price and certainly the current condition of the crop here. So I think, you know, there's still time for producers to do something else that they really want to here. So I'm not sure how many producers are thinking about tearing up the wheat and doing something else with it. But, you know, that's something that's got to be in the consideration here if your wheat's looking really bad is maybe considering going for a different crop here. So, you know, certainly make plans with that. Let your lender know these kind of things that, you know, you're probably going to expect below average yields, which means you're going to have below average uh, net revenue from your wheat crop this year, too. And you'd like them to, with this analysis, use this as as more of a, a baseline of information on that decision. There. Yeah, I kind of want to give producers a heads up, you know, that this is what we're what we're expecting here. And I don't want anybody to be surprised, you know, they go out there and, you know, suddenly, well, when you're, we're not getting the revenue we thought we were going to get from our wheat crop this year. So, you know, Make plans accordingly. Have a look at the article and what it says in full. It's entitled Kansas Wheat Yield Outlook for 2018. Once more, it utilizes those crop condition updates that the USDA puts out each week and then ties this crop condition index into this to get an idea of just where those yields might fall when the harvest time rolls around here. The article is posted on the agmanager.info website for your review, producer. So have a look at that agmanager.info. Good work, Greg. Looking forward to the updates on this, and thank you for coming over. All right. Thank you. He is an agricultural economist, K-State Research and Extension, who has assembled this information. That's Greg Ibendahl, and you're tuned to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Closing out agriculture today now, it's our weekly K-State horticulture segment and uh, getting us oriented once again to vegetable gardening. That time is here. We'll take up one of the very first crops that are managed here in the state of Kansas, and that would be asparagus. Joining us once more is K-State horticulturist Ward Upham. Asparagus retains its popularity year upon year, Ward, and, and in fact, you'd encourage folks that haven't given this a try to do so. I really would. If you haven't had fresh asparagus straight out of the garden, you need to try it because it's a lot different than stuff that's been frozen. And so if you decide to put in an asparagus bed, you're putting in a long-term crop. We still have a crop at home that's been 
probably in place about 50 years. Wow. And so they'll last a long, long time. So first thing you do is choose a spot where you're going to put it. And usually a good place is on the edge of the garden, so you don't have to work all the way around it with your other crops. And also close to water, so you can uh, make sure that it has enough water to do well through the summer because that fern that it makes during the summer is going to determine how long you can harvest that next spring. Next thing you need to do is is determine how much fertilizer you need. Mm -hmm. Uh, Soil test is the best way to do that. But if you don't have time to take a soil test, put on about a pound of a fertilizer that has about 10% nitrogen per 100 square feet. At planting or just prior to then? Prior to planting because you want to mix it into the soil. Now on that fertilizer, that Percent nitrogen is always that first number. You're going to have three numbers on any bag of fertilizer. It would be like a 10, 20, 10, or 11, 15, 11. As long as that first number is somewhere between, let's say, 8 and 13, you're going to be fine with about a pound per 100 square feet. And figure that bed's going to be maybe two feet wide. And so every 50 foot a row, that's how much you're going to put down. And then it needs to be mixed into the soil. And then the next step is to get ready to plant. Now, what we're going to plant are not seed. They're going to be crowns and one-year-old crowns. And so they've been grown by someone so that you're planting a plant that is already going to take off and do really well for you. Mm -hmm. Space those about 18 to 24 inches apart. And two ways to do that, you can dig a, a hole for each one or you can dig a trench. And so a lot of times it's just easier to dig the trench. The trick to this is to get it deep enough. You're not putting this like three or four inches deep. It's better if they go at least six and preferably eight inches deep. The reason for that is if you put them in shallow, it's going to put up a lot of spears, but they're going to be small. And sometimes people think small spears are going to be more tender. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's the large spears that are more tender. So get that down to about six to eight inches deep. You know, just put them in the ground, cover them up, but don't cover that whole trench up at once. But make sure you're getting good root-to-soil contact, obviously. That depth will take care of that. By That's it. right. So you've already got that fertilizer mixed in, and so it's down there where those roots are. And then put maybe a couple inches over top and water it in to get that good root-soil contact so you don't have any air spaces in there. As those plants grow through the summer, you're going to gradually add the soil until you have it back up to the normal level. What about variety selection? Uh, what's on offer out there? Well, we had in the past two major varieties. It was Mary and Martha Washington. However, there's been a lot of breeding work done, and what we have now are what are called male clones. These are ones that are going to produce about three times as much as those old Mary and Martha Washington varieties. And so if it has Jersey in the name, it's going to be one of those male clones. So like Jersey Giant, Jersey King, Jersey Knight, Jersey Supreme, all of those are good varieties and all will produce better than the older varieties that you may have been familiar with when you were a kid. The other thing is uh, don't harvest that year planting, of course. You need to allow that energy to go into getting that plant established. And so first year, no harvest. Second year, then you can harvest maybe three to four weeks. And then third year and thereafter, you could probably harvest six to eight weeks. It just depends on how well that crop is doing. And so when that spear size starts to drop, that's when you want to stop harvesting. Mm -hmm. But break that crop in, and those are the steps to establishing a new asparagus bed. What about those who have asparagus already in place in their garden and managing those existing beds? Yeah, so the first thing is you need to remove the fern if you haven't already. One point we should make is you don't cut down that fern in the fall before it turns completely brown. And you don't have to remove it until the next spring. A lot of people leave it in place because that fern helps collect snow so that you catch water to make sure that those plants are moist in the spring. And so a lot of people aren't going to remove that until spring. Now, how you remove it, there's a lot of different ways. You can use a pruner. So if you have a really small bed, a lot of people just use a mower. You have to go slow, but this is brittle in the spring. Mm -hmm. And so you can use a regular mower and cut it down. Or you can use a string trimmer. Again, you have to take a little bit of time to do that. You have to go slow, but it does take it down. And then once you've got that done, you need to fertilize again. Again, either by soil test or, again, that one pound of like a 10% nitrogen fertilizer 
per 100 square feet. And it's best if you can incorporate that. Now, if you planted those correctly so they're six to eight inches deep, you can till right over the top of of that bed. Mm -hmm. Those crowns are going to stay at that depth. And so I'll probably go three or four inches deep. I'm not going to hit those crowns because I put them at eight inches. And so that gets that fertilizer mixed in the soil and gets it where it's going to be active and get those plants growing well. And that tillage could help with weed control likewise, could it not? It does. And that's a good way in order to control those weeds, especially the winter annuals like henbit and chickweed that tend to come up in that bed over the winter. And so just tilling those under is going to take care of those. You can also mulch asparagus. That's fine to do that. It's probably not a good idea to do that before you start harvesting. In other words, you want that soil to warm up quickly so you get an early harvest. And if you have dark soil, that's going to warm up a whole lot quicker than if that's mulched. So do your tilling, and then once your harvest really starts to get going, then you can go ahead and mulch. And you can use a three or four inch layer of mulch, and that'll help control those weeds. And once more, if it is already established, that bed, the length of harvest that you can anticipate here would be? Six to eight weeks. And it just depends on how well it's doing, but that gives you an idea. Then when you harvest, there's a couple different ways to do that. You can either snap them off or cut them off. Some people like to cut them under the ground. If you do that, the base is going to be a little bit tough, and so cut that off when you're ready to cook them. Mm -hmm. But uh, snapping works just as fine. It's not going to hurt to have that portion sticking up above the soil level. Well, K-State Research and Extension has a flyer on asparagus production in the home garden. You can take a close look at that at the K-State Horticulture website. Ward, thanks for coming over. Thank you. Ward Upham, alongside K-State Research and Extension Horticulturist, on the guidelines to establishing garden asparagus. And that is this week's K-State Horticulture segment. Our thanks to you as well for joining us. Eric Atkinson here. Bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.